Hey folks, Andy Patton here. The Zags had the end of the season loss that many folks feel they needed in order to win it all, falling by 10 to St. Mary's on the road on senior night on Saturday. We're going to talk a lot about that game today while answering listener submitted questions all episode long right here on the Locked On Zags podcast. Don't go away. Locked on Zags, your daily podcast on the Gonzaga Bulldogs. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. What is going on, y'all? Welcome to the Locked On Zags podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. I'm your host and longtime Gonzaga podcaster, Andy Patton, here to take you through another season of Gonzaga Hoops. Today's episode is brought to you by Bet Bet BetOnline has you covered this season with more props, odds, and lines than ever before. Bet Online, where the game starts. I want to thank all of you who make this podcast your first listen of the day. I sincerely appreciate being a part of your morning routine. I also appreciate all of you who have checked out the show on YouTube. If you've been on YouTube for a couple months now, it's been a fast-growing enterprise, a great opportunity to not just listen to what I have to say, but see it as well. If you have not checked it out yet and you are a listener to the show, go to youtube.com, search Locked on Zags, hit that subscribe button. Would really, really appreciate your support in that matter. All right, today is Mailbag Monday. As always, just a reminder for those of you who are new listeners, Or for those of you who have not participated in Mailbag Monday, it is very simple to do so. If you are interested, you can just tweet at me at ScoreZagScore. Whenever you are thinking of a question, you can tweet at LockedOnZags as well. Either account, I'll take the question, I'll put it in my notes, I'll get it prepped for Monday's show. I also reach out to Twitter on Sunday mornings. Soliciting questions, you can respond to that tweet as an easy way to make sure you get in the show as well. You can also reach out to me via email if you have multiple questions that you'd like to ask. Uh, you can reach out that way. It's andypatton 13 at gmail.com. Lots of people use the email to ask questions. It's a great way to get another opportunity to interact with me as well. We're just going to get right into this. Obviously, a disappointing game on Saturday against the Gales. The Zags were held to 57 points. We're going to talk all about that game. This first question here comes from Christian via Gmail. Christian says, what are the takeaways from the St. Mary's game that can be used to make the Zags a better tournament team? Now more than ever, a St. Mary's rematch on a neutral court will feel like a Sweet 16 game. Yeah, I think one of the biggest takeaways, we'll talk specifically about the Zags in a second, but one of the biggest things that I took away from this game that I hope a lot of people watching the game, whether they were Gonzaga fans or not, took away from this game, is that St. Mary's is really freaking good. This is a good basketball team. They well deserve their spot in the top 25 rankings. I think they're probably going to be a top 20, maybe a top 15 team. By the time you're listening to this on Monday, I'm recording this on Sunday evening, so the AP poll has not come out yet, but this is a very good basketball team. The Zags took care of them the first time they played. They won by 16 points, but this is this is, this is a great team. Randy Bennett has done an incredible job with this team. Love him or hate him. Mostly hate him. I understand that, but he's done an incredible job. This team is elite defensively, and they hit big shots. They came to win this basketball game. They had timely shots. They made great offensive possessions. They had good reads on defense, and Gonzaga came out flat. Those are the two realities. We've talked about this before. Gonzaga, When Gonzaga plays their best basketball, nobody in the country can beat them. But when Gonzaga doesn't play their best basketball and the opposing team plays their best basketball, they're susceptible to losses. It doesn't happen all that often. Obviously, it's only happened three times this season. St. Mary's took advantage, had it was emotional. It was senior night. The crowd was there. It was bumping. They took advantage, came out, had a great game. That's my number one takeaway from this game. However, specifically how this game impacts the Zags, the biggest takeaways for me all come on the defensive end. Yes, Gonzaga only scored 57 points. And yes, they only gave up 67 points, which may look like, hey, this was a worse offensive game than it was a defensive game for the Zags. However, I was more concerned about what happened on defense. Offensively, Drew Timmy missed a lot of shots he doesn't normally miss. Andrew Nemhard was uncharacteristically sloppy with the basketball. We had 14 turnovers, only four assists. Those numbers are bad. But I, a lot of the stuff that happened offensively wasn't issues of needing to make adjustments offensively, needing to pass the ball to different players. There wasn't a lot of things that I think they directly need to do differently. I think part of it is that St. Mary's has a very good defense, and they played very, very well on that end of the floor. Part of it was that good players had off nights. 
Now, you can't have all of your good players have an off night on the same time. That's bad. But I don't know how you can really fix that or what the takeaways are there that other than we need to tighten up and we need to be better. Defensively, though, Gonzaga really struggled with the pick and roll. And this was not a complicated offensive set that the, the Gales were running. Not trying to discredit Randy Bennett or their staff, but they weren't running anything it wasn't mind numbing what they were doing. They were running high pick and rolls with Tommy Cousy. They had shooters on the corners. Cousy would either dish the ball to the rolling big man, go to the bucket himself or kick it out to an active shooter. The Zags were listless on defense. They were, they weren't rotating. Well, they weren't, they didn't seem to be communicating all that well. When Chet Holmgren was not in the game, the, uh, the Gales could get to the rim with ease, with tremendous ease. Cousy was getting open lands left and right when Chet Holmgren wasn't in the game. When Chet was in the game, they were less likely to finish around the rim. He still had that impact, even if he didn't have a great statistical game, but it wasn't as pronounced. He wasn't constantly left and right blocking shots. He was altering a few shots here and there, but he wasn't having the same impact he normally has defensively. That is a problem. The Zags have some things they need to work on offensively. There were some opportunities to get out in transition that they passed up on, things that I'd like to see them do a little bit differently. But ultimately, this was a poor defensive effort from them. St. Mary's only scored 67 points, which I know is not a super high number, but they also shot pretty poorly for large chunks of this game and also are a team that runs this very slow, methodical offense where they're not trying to get out and rack up a whole bunch of points. 67 is not bad for them. They're going to win a lot of games scoring 67 points. Case in point here, they, they scored 67 points against the number one offensive team in the country and won by double digits. So for me, the defensive effort needs to get cleaned up. They have eight days before their next game. They have a lot of stuff they need to work on on that end of the floor. Not as concerned offensively, but if they play like this defensively in the NCAA tournament, they're going to be going home a lot sooner than we want them to. Next question comes from Larry via Gmail. Larry says, is that the toughest game Timmy has had in a Gonzaga uniform? And will we ever see Timmy and Holmgren combine for 12 points again? Yes and no. <laughs> Pretty simple answers here. Uh, Timmy had a, had a really awful night. There's not any other way to look at it. He got a lot of good looks. He missed a lot of good looks. He also had a lot of bad looks. He, You could tell he was pressing. This is uncharacteristic for him. Drew Timmy is normally cool under pressure. He normally thrives in hostile environments. He normally doesn't compound mistakes by continuing to struggle and force shots. He did that in this game. I, I could not tell you why. I am not in his head. I don't know whether the crowd truly got to him, whether he was just straight up having an off night, whether there's other stuff going on. None of it is a major cause for concern for me. I don't think Drew Timmy is going to come out super flat for the rest of the season. That would be a significant problem. For the Zags, if it were to happen, I'm not overly concerned about it. Matthias Toss is a good defensive player. He's a big-bodied guy. He pushed Drew Timmy around a little bit. But this is the same Drew Timmy who scored 25 points on Evan Mobley last year. I think, with no disrespect to St. Mary's or Toss or anybody, I think this had a lot more to do with Drew Timmy having a bad night. Heck, even at halftime, when Randy Bennett was asked by ESPN's Molly McGrath about their defense on Drew Timmy, Bennett's first response was, well, he's missing a lot of shots he doesn't normally miss. For Bennett to admit that at halftime is a pretty good indication of, of how they have struggled to defend him throughout his career and how this game was, was a significant anomaly. Timmy and Holmgren, if they combine for 12 or less points again, it's probably the last game Gonzaga plays with Chet Holmgren on the roster. That, that This cannot happen again. This is a pair that's scored over 40 points together multiple times this season. They were completely pulled out of the rhythm offensively, and it sunk the Zags. I do not think it will happen again. I can say that with pretty relative confidence. I can say with a lot of confidence that if it does happen again, especially in the NCAA tournament, that's probably the last game the Zags will play. Next question comes from Christian. Christian says, was there an attempt at a counterpunch last night? If so, I missed it. Yeah, I've seen this narrative a lot that the Zags kind of gave up or that the Zags didn't really attempt to push back. And that's just not true. Uh, the Zags were down 15 at one point in the second half. They were down 15 going into the second half. They cut the deficit. The Gales brought it back up to 15. The Zags then cut it to six. This thing got within six. I, it should have got closer. It should have got closer than that. Rasir Bolton was excellent in the second half. He single-handedly willed this team back into the game. It took a long time, and every time the Zags got a little bit of momentum, they threw it away. There was a nice possession where they got a little bit of momentum and felt like they were moving, and then Julian Strother turned the ball over immediately after he got it. Logan Johnson threw down a thunderous dunk, which sucked the air out of Gonzaga, and any momentum that they had at that point was gone. Then, of course, you had Kyle Bowen hitting those two huge threes. He was 0 for 7 from behind the arc, and then the Zags smartly 
left him open. They kind of let him take some shots there because they were focused so hard on stopping everybody else. And then Bowen knocked down two huge threes. If he doesn't make those shots, I'm not saying the Zags win. I don't know that that was the whole difference in the game, but they probably get within six. And the narrative about this game, this concern that the Zags kind of gave up or didn't play uh, for a full 40 minutes probably goes away if Bowen doesn't hit those two shots because the Zags probably get it to within three at one point, And all of a sudden the conversation's a little bit different. Next question comes from Pace and Space Jam on Twitter. He says, we got to look at tonight and think, who is the player that fought hard until the end unwavered? Not sure if I can pick somebody. Uh, pick Bolton. Pick, pick Rasir Bolton. Rasir Bolton played phen phenomenal in the second half of this game. He finished the game with 16 points. He made three of Gonzaga's five three-pointers. He scored seven points early in the second half that whittled the lead down significantly. The Zags had a great first four minutes in the second half. St. Mary's kind of withstood the punch punched back. And from there, they kind of managed to maintain a lead right until the end of the game when the Zags finally crawled back a little bit before Bowen put them away for good. But Bolton played phenomenal. He hit some big buckets late. He had the, that big run early in the second half by himself. I don't think anybody gave up. I don't think anybody didn't fight hard until the end. I don't know I can't, I don't watch the game and think that guys were just not trying at the end of the game. That's not a thing that I picked up, uh, but I would specifically target Monsieur Bolton as a guy who pretty obviously fought very, very hard until the very end of this basketball game, trying to will this team back to win it. Final question of the first segment comes from Larry. Larry says, did they get these stats right for the Zags? Four assists and 14 turnovers. Yeah, this is a huge credit to St. Mary's here. Obviously, the Zags, that's bad. <laughs> like it's not, it's not that the Zags played well and just happened to turn the ball over 14 times. Obviously, some of this was mistakes. Some of the turnovers were pretty egregiously bad mistakes by Gonzaga's offensive players. But St. Mary's came in with a strong game plan. They were trying to get the Zags to turn the ball over early. Again, some of that is a credit to St. Mary's. Some of that is, you know, Nembhard had one of those games. He's He hasn't had this game in a while. <laughs> we talked about how great he was against UCLA, and then we saw him really struggle against Tarleton, Alabama. And then he kind of came back into form and was the best point guard in the WCC by a tremendous margin. And now he, he regressed in this game. I don't think it's permanent. I'm not overly concerned about it being a significant problem for him going forward. But we've talked about how he's the engine that makes this thing go. When he's not having a good game, it impacts everybody else on the roster. And that was part of what happened here. He's not the reason Drew Timmy missed some bunnies around the rim, but him not being his normal efficient self, him not getting guys wide open looks under the basket on pick and rolls, him turning the ball over uncharacteristically 40 feet away from the basket. That kind of stuff takes a toll on everybody on the roster. And I think that that was, that was a big part of the story for this game. Uh, we got more listener submitted questions coming your way in the second segment. Before we get there though, I want to tell you all about bet online. There might be less football being played, but betonline.net has way more stuff to bet on this playoff season. From scores, totals, and player performance props to where the next fired coach is going to land, BetOnline is the number one spot for all things NFL betting in 2022. And it's not just football. BetOnline.net's basketball, hockey, boxing, and UFC odds coverage is the best in the business. From sports right down to your favorite Vegas casino games, BetOnline is your number one online wagering destination. BetOnline is the fastest and easiest way to wager on all of your favorite sports and play your favorite games. BetOnline, where the game starts. All right, segment two, still Andy Patton, still locked on Zags, still answering listener-submitted questions for Mailbag Monday after the Zags' third loss of the season against St. Mary's on Saturday evening. This first question comes from Nathan Keel at Nathan underscore Nation on Twitter who says, the bench has been such a weapon for the Zags this season, but lately the production has been on the decline, especially with Watson and Hickman. What is the level of concern primarily with these two heading into March? So I've, I always try to take a pretty optimistic, positive attitude. And I think I'm, most of my takeaways from this game are pretty optimistic and positive. The bench production lately is probably my biggest concern for this team going forward. I think uh, I've mentioned already, I think a lot of the offensive stuff will take care of itself in time. Drew Timmy is such an efficient scorer. I don't think he's going to have egregious halves like he did in the first half or, or full games, really. Andrew Nembhard will take care of some of his turnover issues. but And I think defensively, they'll make some adjustments. I'm a little concerned about the defense, but I think they'll make some adjustments. But the bench production has been abysmal lately. In the last three games for the Zags, which again, three tough teams, Santa Clara, San Francisco, St. Mary's, bench has scored 10 points. 
Seven of those 10 points came from Hunter Salas against San Francisco on Thursday. Anton Watson and Nolan Hickman have been non-existent in the last couple of weeks for the Zags. Somebody pointed out, I believe it was a YouTube commenter, pointed out that a lot of Watson's most productive games have not come against very good appoint, opponents. And that, there's some reality to that. I don't think that that means that Anton Watson is not as good as his some of his production has indicated. I think a big part of that conversation is the simple fact that Watson plays less against good teams. They ride Drew Timmy and they ride Chet Holmgren more against good teams. So Watson, instead of playing 18 to 20 minutes, maybe only plays nine to 10 minutes. So of course his production takes a dip. But at the end of the day, he needs to be better. <laughs> There's no other way to put it. He's had a very up and down season. He's had four game stretches where he completely disappeared. He's had five, six game stretches where he's one of the best six men in the entire country. He's been, he's been all over the place. And right now he's in a pretty significant lull. He looked lost offensively. He's not looking for his shot. He's not that same aggressive player driving to the basket away from the rim. He's not looking for post moves down low. When he does, he's getting his shot blocked. He's not getting good looks around the rim. He's turning the ball over. He's been really, really not good the last couple of games. That needs to change. The Zags cannot rely on Drew Timmy and Chet Holmgren to combine for 40 every single game. I said they're not going to combine for 12 ever again, and I believe that, but if they only combine for 28 in a game, they're going to need 10 points from Anton Watson in the paint. And if he can't give them that, that's going to be a problem. Nolan Hickman has also really struggled the last few games. Part of that is probably just freshman lulls. Freshmen go through lulls at the end of the regular season in particular because it's a really long season and longer a longer season than they, they have ever played before. But he is he's turned the ball over a lot more recently. He's not that cool, collected, calm a freshman that we saw him be a little earlier in the season. He's maybe pressing a little bit more, not his decision-making hasn't been as good. The shots aren't falling for him. Again, the Zags don't need him as much, but in a game where Andrew Nembhard struggles, it'd be really nice to be able to give Nolan Hickman six to eight minutes of, of good production off the bench where Nembhard can clear his head, get a little breather, and the Zags don't have to worry about the engine still moving on offense. Hickman has not been able to give them those minutes lately. Just straight up has not been able to do it. It forces Nembhard to play a lot more minutes. It forces him to play when he's tired and struggling, which doesn't usually lead to very good production. If no, Nemhard, or excuse me, if Hickman and Watson do not pick up their production in March, I would have significant doubts about whether this team can go as far as they did last year. Those two guys are critical pieces. And I'm not including Hunter Salas in this only because Hunter Salas has been playing his best basketball lately. He's playing very well. He didn't have a huge impact on the St. Mary's game, but pretty much nobody did. And I don't think I don't think Hunter South was not the problem on Saturday against the Gale. I don't think that anybody's arguing that he was. But lately, the production from Watson and Hickman has not been there. And if that doesn't tick up, the Zags are going to have some problems in March. Next question comes from Christian via Gmail. Christian says, did this game resemble last year's championship game against Baylor? The stat that was mentioned during the broadcast was that the Zags have trailed three games at the half and that those are their three losses. Is this being overemphasized, or is this a bigger issue to be concerned about moving forward? Uh, two separate questions here. I'll take them separately. I don't really think the halftime thing is that big of a deal. Uh, I, I don't want to say it's just a coincidence, because obviously it's it's not entirely a coincidence, but I, the Zags also closed the gap in, in, a, in, I think, all three of those games, at least definitely against Duke, and definitely against St. Mary's, they closed the gap. Uh, with Duke, obviously, they only lost by three. They got within very close at the end of that game. Uh, in this game, of course, they got within six before Kyle Bowen hit those threes. So it's not like the Zags go into halftime losing and just crumble. They have have staged comebacks in, in a handful of their games that they were losing in the second half. So I don't think I'm not overly concerned about it. The Zags are losing a game at halftime in the NCAA tournament. Depending on the rest of the situation, that's I don't think that's a death sentence. I don't think that, that means whether well, there's no way they're going to come back from this because they're 0 for 3 in those games this year. You can bet it'll be talked about on the broadcast, but I don't think it's necessarily a direct correlation to this Gonzaga roster in any way. Regarding the Baylor game, there's some similarities. There was a lot of differences as well. Baylor was a significantly better offensive team. They were a more efficient scoring team. Uh, they were not as methodical with the basketball as St. Mary's is. St. Mary's was a little tighter defensively. Baylor had more athleticism in their in their backcourt, was able to overwhelm Gonzaga as soon as they crossed half court. That wasn't really what St. Mary's was doing. Uh, the big similarities, uh, Baylor and St. Mary's both exploited Gonzaga on high pick and rolls. 
really significantly. That was a huge part of the reason that they struggled against Baylor and cost them a lot of points in the St. Mary's game as well. And then Drew Timmy being horrifically out of sorts is kind of the only other similarity, obvious similarity. There's more if I were to watch the tape on both these games. I'm sure you'd see more similarities, but those are the big obvious ones is Gonzaga getting exploited defensively on pick and rolls and Drew Timmy struggling offensively. Those are two pretty significant similarities. And if those things happen again in another game in March, again, it's 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 going to be a challenge for the Zags to overcome. Next question comes from Dad Risk on Twitter. He says, the only two times GU's had a great lead guard who could consistently go downhill to get a bucket, they made the final four. Does it concern you that this team doesn't have that? Nemhard's great in his role, but he's not that guy. So I don't agree with the premise uh, for a couple of reasons. Uh, one, Jeremy Pargo was an extraordinarily good downhill scorer, and they did not make the Final Four. So I would not say that the only times Gonzaga's had a lead guard who could go downhill, they've made the Final Four. That's just not true. I also, I'm assuming that this is a reference to Nigel Williams-Goss being Gonzaga's great lead guard downhill scorer on the 2016-17 team. And I'm just, I'm not sure that I fully buy that. Again, it's not that Nigel Williams-Goss was bad as a downhill scorer. He was quite good at that, but I don't think that that was his like M.O., not in the way that it was Pargo's MO, certainly not in the way that it was Suggs's MO. That was Suggs's greatest strength was getting downhill as a scorer. It was also what made Jeremy Pargo so elite on those, you know, late two, late 2000s teams as well. But I, I don't know that there's a, the super strong correlation here. The 16-7 team made the national championship not because of Nigel Williams-Goss's ability to get downhill. They made it because their low post scoring was elite and they were an elite defensive team. They had four legitimately great defensive players in the paint. They had great perimeter defensive players. They had great shooting and guys like Perkins and Jonathan, or excuse me, Jordan Matthews. I don't think that their, their path to the national championship had a lot to do with downhill scoring from the guards. Obviously, last year's roster, Jalen Suggs, that was a huge part of it. Joel Ayayi was a good scorer as well, though not really much of a downhill score. That wasn't really his game. And obviously, Drew Timmy was a huge force in the paint. I think the main comparisons between the 16-17 team and last year's team was great low post scoring, good defensive players, and very and and good and solid outside shooting and i think that this year's team has most of that they're a great low post scoring team with drew and chet obviously they're much improved defensively even over last year's roster uh, yes nemhard's not a great downhill scorer i also think ros bolton is a good downhill scorer he's not the lead guard necessarily but he when when tasked with that role he can do that very capably i also don't think that nemhard not being a great downhill scorer is necessarily problematic for the Zags because he can come off a pick and if he wants to go to the basket, he's very good at it. He can pull up in the mid range. He can make that pass. I know he did not have a good game on Saturday, but we have seen him be very lethal as a pick and roll point guard. And I don't think that his lack of ability to score downhill and isolation ball is, is necessarily going to be an impact on this team uh, when they get deeper into the NCAA tournament. Next question comes from Larry. Larry says, chances they get the Gales in the WCC championship and we have a repeat. Uh, the, chan the chance of facing St. Mary's in the championship game of the WCC are pretty high. The chances of a repeat game like this, very, very slim. <laughs> I do not think that Gonzaga is going to struggle the way that they did again. I just don't think it's going to happen. St. Mary's is good for a game like this every couple of years. And that doesn't mean that they're only capable of beating Gonzaga every few years. I don't think that's true. But you know, we remember 2019. We remember that game in Vegas that just sucked the life out of the entire Orleans arena. I think the Zags were held to 47, 45 points in that game, even worse than they did on Saturday. And the Gales just sucked the life out of them. The Zags couldn't make open shots. They weren't getting enough looks. The St. Mary's can do this to Gonzaga, but they don't do it to Gonzaga very often. Mark Few is a good coach. He makes adjustments. He's going to watch the hell out of this tape. He's going to figure out the ways that Gonzaga didn't exploit certain opportunities. And beyond that, if Drew Timmy makes half the shots he normally makes, this game is is a tie game. The, the, the score is basically the same. If you know, if a couple other guys hit some shots that they normally hit, if Chet Holmgren has a bit more of an impact on offense, this doesn't happen again. I think if St. Mary's comes out, plays excellent defense in the national, or excuse me, in the WCC championship game, and really flusters Gonzaga, as long as Gonzaga doesn't miss as many obvious open easy shots as they did in this game, it's at least going to be come down to the wire. I don't think that we're going to have a wire to wire. St. Mary's takes the lead and never relinquishes a type game again. I just don't think that that's going to happen. Next up comes from Christian. Christian says, 
I was listening to the USF USD game on the radio, and after the game, Todd Golden spoke very articulately and honestly about how he feels USF is closer to an eight seed than a bubble team, and that the Don should be the number three seed in the WCC tournament. Since Santa Clara played one less game, both lost both their games to USF and did not play Portland. There were two messages here, one about the WCC tournament and the other about the WCC respect nationally. Do you have any thoughts on these issues? Okay, for one thing, it's, it's interesting that Golden is advocating for we feel we're more deserving of an eight seed than being a bubble team because obviously they, they deserve to make the NCAA tournament, but a bubble team would get an 11 seed. And frankly, I would way rather be an 11 seed than an eight seed. Eight seed is like one of the least desirable spots you can be in all of college basketball in the NCAA tournament. It's a horrible seed. So if 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 they went out and, and play the Zags in the national championship game and play their way out of the bubble and up onto the eight line, I don't, I don't know how much of a win that is. I'd almost rather be in a first four game as an 11 seed because if you win that game, then you got a chance to play a six seed, then you got a chance to play a three seed, and there's maybe a little bit more room. You don't have to tell Gonzaga fans how appealing an 11 seed can be. They've done a lot of damage on that 11 line in the past. That's not the point of the question, though, just a weird note that I had. Um, yeah, USF is better than most of the teams on the bubble. I don't think there's a lot of debate there. Talent-wise, having watched them played, they deserve – more consideration than a lot of the bubble teams. But I understand that looking at the resume, it's a tough sell. They lost to Portland. They're going to finish fourth in the WCC going into the WCC tournament. That's where they're going to be slotted in. It's a tough sell. They didn't lose a lot of games. They didn't lose a lot of bad teams. The Grand Canyon loss kind of sticks out. The Portland loss definitely sticks out. Uh, but I understand why they're on the bubble. I, I, I think that things need to change in the way that we view mid-major teams in order for them to not constantly be on the bubble if they lose even just a handful of games. But I understand why it is the way that it is. In terms of respect for the WCC National, yeah, it's still never enough, but it's not going to ever be enough. As long as Gonzaga continues to dominate the conference, people are not going to treat those teams as if they're any good. They're just going to assume that if Gonzaga is beating them very badly, they must be bad. And then when teams like St. Mary's win, the narrative is not, well, St. Mary's must actually be good. A lot of that narrative is, well, Gonzaga finally lost. And I, I don't know that it's ever going to change. I, I would like for it to. Um, unfortunately, when coaches like Golden express frustration with we're not getting a lot of respect nationally, it makes me think that as soon as Stanford fires their coach or Andy Enfield at USC jumps to another job on the East Coast, that, that Golden's gone. I mean, he's going to go take a Pac-12 job where he can feel like he's got a better chance of getting high-level recruits and all of that. I hope it doesn't happen. But I, he just, he's not talking like somebody who, who wants to stick around necessarily and try to build this program into the next Gonzaga. He, he might be looking at, at doing something else. Two segments down, one more coming up. We're going to answer even more listener submitted questions. Before we do that, though, I want to tell you all about Built Bar. This is the time of the year that I've pretty much given up on all of my New Year's resolutions, but not this year. I'm sticking to my resolution to eat right thanks to Built Bar. It almost feels like it's not really a resolution because I actually enjoy eating them. Have you tried the puffs? If you haven't, you're missing out on one of Built Bar's best tasting bars. Puffs are the first ever protein infused marshmallow. They're fluffy, they're marshmallowy, they're not just a protein bar, they're a treat. And they're covered in 100% real chocolate. In fact, all Built Bars are covered in 100% real chocolate. A typical candy bar can be anywhere from two to 300 calories. Most Built Bars contain 130 calories, four grams of sugar, four net carbs, and 17 grams of protein. They have mint brownie, coconut, coconut almond, and new for this month, white chocolate cookies and cream. They are all delicious and new flavors are coming out all of the time. Go to Built.com, use promo code LOCKED15, and get 15% off your order. That's promo code LOCKED15 for 15% off at Built.com. All right, segment three, still Andy Patton, still locked on Zags, still answering listener-submitted questions all episode long. We got two more questions to get through today, both submitted by Aaron via Gmail. This first question, he says, what are some of the most notable headlines or stories, good or bad, from Gonzaga's regular season. Yeah, so if we were doing like a book or a, a story series about the 2021-2022 Gonzaga season, obviously it's not over yet, and most of the biggest storylines have yet to happen. But here are some of the biggest things that came to my mind that happened this season that are kind of worthy of maybe chapter headings <laughs> in a book about the Zags. Uh, number one, unfortunately, not the happiest way to start out the season, but Mark Few got arrested for a DUI. That happened in, in on Labor Day, uh, September, early September. Mark Few obviously got arrested. It was a whole story. Uh, we've moved past it. He got his suspension. There was some consternation about the length 
of the suspension, which I think was an understandable conversation to be having. The Zags added that extra exhibition game, which kind of helped alleviate the suspension for Coach Few and allowed him to be back in time for that Texas game. But that was definitely the biggest, the first biggest story of the season for the Zags. The next big story for the Zags this year was Drew Timmy dropping 37 points against Texas. It was Gonzaga's first ranked game of the season. It was their second actual game of the season. A huge matchup. Chris Beard, new coach over at Texas. A lot of transfers on that roster. Kind of what is what is his new look defense going to look like with this new group of players? Obviously, when he was at Texas Tech, they had upset Gonzaga in the Elite Eight a few years previously. So there was some kind of debate about how their defense might impact Gonzaga. Of course, Chet Holmgren making his first appearance in a really big game. He had a a pretty minimal impact on that game. He only had two points and five boards, but Drew Timmy dropped 37. The Zags handled the Longhorns pretty significantly. It was a big, big win, put a lot more confidence in people believing in this team after, after last year's run. And then, of course, Gonzaga demolishing UCLA. That was one of the most fun games I've ever been a part of. Dickie V on the call, first game on the call since uh, he you know, had his cancer diagnosis, was able to come back and, and call that game. He was super emotional. He was crying before the game. It was in Las Vegas. It was this super exciting game, and the Zags just absolutely blew the doors off the Bruins. Yes, they were missing Cody Cody Riley, their big man up front, and I know that they've been dealing with some illnesses, but still the Zags just absolutely crushed them. It was an extremely exciting game. Obviously, the Duke game was a few days later, another big part of their story as well. Paulo versus Chet, this big, exciting freshman matchup, one of the most fun basketball games ever. The Zags, unfortunately, did not come out on top. In that one, but to lose by three is kind of a wash. Prove those two teams are very evenly matched. And Chet versus Paolo, Paolo did not disappoint. Even if Bancaro missed a lot of the second half with that cramping issue, it was still still a really fun game. Then, of course, you had the horrible stretch against Tarleton State, Alabama, and Mary Mack. Really rough couple of games for the Zags. You know, fortunate to go two and one in that stretch. Obviously, the Alabama game was was a disaster. They they did not defend the perimeter well at all. There were some strange late game coaching decisions from Mark Few, which is uncharacteristic. He benched Chet Holmgren for the final five minutes, even though Chet only had one foul and was making a large impact defensively. The Drew Timmy had an off night. He couldn't get his shots going. Uh, Andrew Nembhard was kind of in the midst of a really big struggle for him where he's turning the ball over a lot, not looking particularly confident uh, in his abilities offensively. Uh, and then we kind of we came out of that stretch. We were a little unsure what this team was. They weren't shooting the ball well. Then they went out and played Texas Tech and decimated them. Really nice game against the Red Raiders, a game that paid dividends for them significantly throughout the year as the Red Raiders picked up some very big wins later in the season. Mark Adams, first time head coach over there. Uh, but the Zags did won that game by hitting a ton of threes, which was huge for them to prove that they were capable of doing that. And then we got into conference play and, you know, three straight games of over 110 points. That's absolutely a part of this story. They're just scoring at a record high pace in the WCC. Then we have Chet Holmgren's ridiculous ascension to prove why he deserves to be in that conversation for the number one overall pick. Uh, monster games early in the WCC play. Most notably that 98 second stretch against the University of San Diego where he had 11 points, three threes, got a rebound, got a block shot in literally a minute and 38 seconds. Sean Farnham was straight up speechless <laughs> while broadcasting that game. An incredible stretch from one of the most exciting young players in recent memory in, in uh, the NCAA. And then, of course, you had the highlight reel dunk against San Francisco on Thursday. There's there's a whole section that could just be Chet Holmgren highlights. Obviously, we could talk about all of those because he's been so, so remarkable this season. And then one that I wanted to touch about, Chet Holmgren always brings other people to his post-game press conferences. I don't know how much people have seen this, but when he gets interviewed after the game, whether it's by ESPN or whether it's a local broadcast, he brings somebody else who had a good game. He brought Julian Strother in a game where Julian had, I think, 19 points. He brought Roz Bolton in a game where Bolton had 15 or 16 points. He, he he likes to share the love. He likes to make sure that he's he's not taking all of the credit for Gonzaga's success, and I think that's that's a big part of this season as well. And the final question of the show, again, from Aaron, same, same sentiment. He says, what are some of the most notable headlines or stories, good or bad, around all of college basketball that developed throughout the season? Yeah, so the first thing that happened before the season was the NIL, NLI rules allowing student-athletes to profit off their name, image, likeness. We have not necessarily been flooded with those types of things, but we've heard stories of athletes who've been able to, you know, buy shoes for the rest of their teammates. Paige Buckers at UConn did that where she got a shoe deal and gave 
shoes to everybody on our team. Obviously, we've seen the Drew Timmy commercials for Northern Quest Casino, so we know that that's something he's been doing as well. Again, I don't think it's been as prevalent and in our face as many people may have thought that it would be, but it has definitely been a part of the changing landscape in college sports as well. Same with the transfer portal. It was so, so busy over the offseason. We've also seen some transfers have remarkable seasons. Uh, nationally, you know, Oscar Shubwe at Kentucky, uh, National Player of the Year candidate. He was a transfer. Walker Kessler at Auburn has been a huge part of their success this season, a transfer from North Carolina. Uh, there are tons and tons of other transfers who I'm not mentioning here because I don't have the time, but obviously that that has been a huge story this season, the transfers and the NLI. Some more specific things, Tommy Lloyd. Tommy Lloyd's been a huge storyline this season, not just in Gonzaga land, not just in West Coast College Hoops. He led this team to the number two ranking in the country, a team that he didn't recruit a lot of players on this team. It was Sean Miller's guys. They underperformed last year under Miller. He took this team. He got them out running. He got them doing the Mark Few Gonzaga offense, and they were one of the best teams, are one of the best teams in college basketball, a team that has the very real possibility of going to the national championship. An incredible first season as a head coach for Tommy Lloyd. Providence, Ed Cooley has done a phenomenal job with the Friars. They've had a really lucky season for those who follow a lot of the advanced metrics. This team should have lost a lot more games than they have lost, but they've had a great year sitting atop the standings in the Big East. That's been a really nice season. Um, some of the other stuff, an unfortunate one, seven Top 10 teams all lost on the same day. That's the first time that has ever happened. Teams one through six and team ranked number nine all lost on Saturday. That's a little too fresh for us to talk, talk too much about because that would obviously impacted the Zags on Saturday against St. Mary's, but that is definitely a, a pretty big storyline from this season. It's it's uh, I was going to say rare, but not, not just rare. It is unprecedented for seven top 10 teams to lose on the same day. I think the revolving door for the top pick has been a big storyline this year. For a long time, it was Paolo. For a long time, it was Jabari Smith. It's it's transitioned to being Chet for the most part recently. Jaden Ivey from Purdue has been a part of that conversation as well. There's been a little bit of debate and, and conversation around the topic. I know a lot of people who follow college, follow college basketball don't really like talking about the NBA draft until the season's over. I understand that. But it's, it's rare that there is a storyline about who's going to be the number one pick. And it has been something that has been talked about quite a bit throughout the season. Johnny Davis and Wisconsin has been a big storyline as well. They've they've been doing really, really well in the Big Ten. Johnny Davis, potential player of the year for Wisconsin, a very, very elite scoring guard. And then we got Duke in the ACC. Really can't can't not can't avoid talking about the ACC when talking about college basketball storylines. Coach K's final year, he's taken his victory lap. Every single thing that he does has been in the news because it's his final season. The ACC rewarded him by being complete dog crap all season long. Nobody in the conference is good besides Duke. It's become a, a laughable joke at this point that some of the mid-major programs, including the WCC and the Mountain West and the Big East, are, are like on par with the ACC. That's not entirely true. Obviously, it's a bit of an exaggeration, but the ACC has really struggled, and it has actually made it a little bit more difficult for Duke to maintain a spot in the top 10 for the rankings because if they have bad games in the ACC, they're notably bad because of how not good those teams have been. Those are just a few. There's a ton of storylines. College basketball is so fun every single season. Every Saturday is just an absolute blast with games from 9 a.m. to 10 p.m., especially on the West Coast. It's been a, been a really fun season. I'm sad the regular season over, but I am pumped for conference tournament season. And of course, March Madness is going to be an absolute blast. Eight days without Gonzaga basketball. I'm dreading it. I know you all are too, but we got tons of really fun stuff coming up this week. Multiple guests coming on the show to talk brackets, to talk Gonzaga, to talk Lady Zags, all of this fun stuff coming up this week. I'm super excited about it. It's all going to be right here on the Locked on Zags podcast which is available wherever you get podcasts and now available on YouTube. Thank you again to those of you who have made this podcast your first listen of the day. Now is a great time to make your second listen of the day, the Locked On NFL Draft Podcast. Ryan Tracy and former NFL cornerback Eric Crocker bring the NFL Draft to life every day with insight and analysis on college football prospects and NFL front offices. It's free and available wherever you get podcasts. All right, thank you all for listening and go Zags.